the accident. And then there was the accident. Well, I guess there's nothing like an old fool. That was a that was a tough day. That was a real tough day. <sighs> My dad wrecked. Picture this. Never rode anything more than a bicycle. You know, pedal, two pedals down the street. Pretty basket in the front. Try to find motorcycles and see if we can teach my dad how to drive a motorcycle. First, we're gonna make a stop by the beach and then maybe make it up to the center part of town. See if we can rent motorcycles there. It's always an adventure. There was a lot leading up to us taking these motorbikes and there was a lot of talking about it and over the last six months and we really wanted to take the time to teach him and yeah. Let off the gas. No gas while you're turning. Uh, so this guy here, I'm 73 years old. And now, in my infinite wisdom. I'll just turn it. And just let your feet hold it. If that's what you got to do to turn for now, that's what you do. At 73 years old, I climb on a crotch rocket. Dude, really? It was just a scooter. 125 cc. Like 20 miles per hour, maybe 15. It wasn't even, maybe 15. You crash going 10? Yeah, you crash going 10 miles per hour. Small scooter. It's very small scooter. It scooter. was itty bitty. <laughs> a skateboarder would have passed you. Yes. In fact, a girl on a push scooter passed you. <laughs> ah, for me it was a crotch rush. Anyway, I climb on this motor bike. Originally, it was so funny because when we first got the bikes, um, I was paying the guy, taking care of all the stuff, and we ran down the road, and my dad tried to turn around and he dropped the bike. Well, first thing I do is I do a nose plant when I make a turn. No big deal. Everybody's entitled to one fault, right? <laughs> Don't learn. Then we went off, and we rode on the beach road. So the scooter was so freeing, and my dad rode a couple of miles down the beach. It was beautiful. So down the beach we go. Boom. Let's get some sun, baby. It's time to go. Oh, oh, oh. No, we the show. Let's get you come on, let's control. Got to live or we get too old. Come on, shine. motorcycles that day and we were making a right turn at an intersection we turned the corner there was a little bit of traffic Jeff went to the right and I could hear Steve behind me and I looked over and I saw kind of coming at me so I hit the gas and that's the last thing I remember <laughs> that's when I heard a throttle way too much throttle and I saw the accident out of the very corner of my eye. I saw the motorcycle falling over and I saw Gordon on the ground. And when I looked back, I saw him slide. And I thought, holy cow, here we go. Jeff and I both turned our motorcycles around in the street together. We pulled up to the accident. From that moment on, I was in crisis mode and, you know, Nothing mattered, and I forgot that there was a GoPro sitting on my handlebars. Now I'm going to give you a warning that the next few minutes are real life, and things can change in a heartbeat like that. And that's what you're going to see now.
you know, in my full-time job, my, my everyday job, and the big emphasis is safety. And a lot of the things they teach you and the things you train for is to look for the warning signs. Beat it before it happens, not after it happens. And uh, I was really kicking myself in the rear end for this one because all the signs were there. And there was opportunities for us to jump in and kind of, maybe I should have put them on the back of mine. Maybe I should have, you know, what ifs. All these side chair, armchair quarterbacks, whatever they're called, you know, secondary rethoughts and all of this crap. But I knew he wasn't comfortable riding. I should have put my foot down right then and there, but I did not. He probably would have fought us and done it anyway, even if we asked him not to. He would have fought me. He would have, he would have argued with us, and we would have done it anyway. But at least I could have said, I told you so. All the training in the world wouldn't have helped me. I had nothing. I had nothing but a wallet in my pocket with some money in it. But there he was in the street. Uh, it didn't look good. My initial thoughts were, uh-oh, this is not going to end well. Oh, my goodness, what am I going to tell Miss Jane? What am I going to tell her? I've had some medical training in the past, but when it's your friend line there, all that went away. Not to mention the fact that there's no emergency medical system here in Vietnam. Bystanders were just standing around. No one spoke English. We were scared to death. It... It does something to you. It, it, it really just changes the way you think about everything. There was no ambulance. There's no paramedics. There's no 911 here. And uh, you, you're in a country where nobody speaks your language. Uh, we, were, we were very fortunate that a, a, a golf cart showed up. And we, the bystanders just snatched him up and threw him in the golf cart. So once we picked him up and got him off the ground, and once you know these people came around us and we were able to lift him and we, they, tried to put, they wanted to put him on a motorcycle and I wouldn't let him and I, we ended up getting him into one of these trolleys that he wanted to ride in anyway and later we kind of made some jokes about that that hey dad you might not remember it but you did get to ride in one of these trolley cars and we got him in the trolley car and I think later the guy even yelled at Steve or got mad at Steve because there was blood in the seat and blood all over me and so we got him from there and we went to the initial hospital where they kind of wrapped his head and they got him patched and they sent us in a cab. And took off going to the hospital. And of course Jeff got in the golf cart with his dad and there I was in the street, golf cart driving away. Oh, I gotta follow these guys. So I put my helmet on, I jumped on my motorcycle and forgot that I was in chaotic traffic. I was beeping the horn and I caught up to the golf cart and we made it to the hospital. And it finally started to tone down and, and he started to somewhat body relax and, and which scared me at the same time because in some ways I thought he was fading on me. And there was a lot of moments where I thought he was fading on me because he'd get real quiet, but then he'd fight again and, and I just wanted him, I, I, I kind of wanted him in more pain in order to feel like I knew he was still fighting for it. And every time he would relax, it would scare the living shit out of me. This young man showed up and he asked me, just like 20, 30 minutes in, they were asking a million questions. We got him passports and we got stuff. We had to put down $100. And he asked if we had okay amount of money. And I was like, what are we talking? Thousands? What, how much are we talking? And he was like, hundred, a couple of hundred. And I was like, we got it. Let's do it. Just do whatever you got to do. And they brought him in and they did an x-ray on him. And I helped carry him to the x-ray. And then I had to help carry him and place him onto the table for the uh, CAT scan and they CAT scan him and I'm being stuffed into a CAT scan and I'm going people are talking Vietnamese and I'm saying whoa I did two tours in this country in combat and never got hurt here I come vacation and I'm gonna die <laughs> and they pulled me out of that thing and I don't remember anything again and at some point in the middle of all of this, the young doctor, or I think he was like a liaison in the hospital, came to me and he said, uh, "Do you have you ever heard of a man named Gordy? And uh, he's an expat. And if you don't know what an expat is, it's just an ex-military person that decides to move and go t to a country. And Gordy served here. And I said, no, he seems like a wonderful man. Um, I thought the question was really stupid at the moment because I was like, why do I care about this guy on Facebook? Or why do I care about this guy you know? I, I mean, I'm glad you know another American. Who cares? Fix my dad. 
I just knew I had to go through step by step and step by step and get it all done and make sure he was all right. And I had to get him back to my mom and I had to get him back home. And then I got to hold my dad's hand and with no anesthesia or anything, they put six stitches in his head. Somehow the deal piercing my head right up there kind of woke me up. <laughs> and they put four big old stitches in there. So guess what? We sat up. <laughs> Oh, they didn't tell me I broke two damn ribs. Put it back here, put it right here, and I laid back down again. <laughs> and I hurt. I was glad to hear that uh, Gordon didn't have any really bad head injury other than a, you know, a possible concussion. And we had to watch him for a few days and some broke ribs. And then about 25, 30 minutes later, a man walked in and, and the young man from the hospital walked in and he says, you know, Jeff, um, this is Gordy. And this man stood there and Gordy was absolutely amazing. Uh, Gordy helped us, Gordy explained a lot of stuff. My dad started to come too and I introduced him and we had to introduce him and he was struggling to remember Gordy's name even though it's Gordon and Gordon. <laughs> Thank you, Gordy. Um, you have no clue what you did for us, for me and Steve, for my dad, you have no clue. You have, you have absolutely no clue. And, you know, Gordy came with us back to the house and then he brought me out to a place to get food so we could bring food to the house. And Gordy did so amazing and he brought us and, and, and you know, we are so blessed because of what happened. I believe it brought me and my father closer. I believe it changed this trip dramatically. But in a way, it's supposed to be what happened. It's what happened. And it's okay. And, and he was better in a few days and it, and it turned out, it turned out okay. Um, but it was, it was very scary. Uh, we, we didn't, we didn't know what was going to happen. And, uh, 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 next time I'll know better. Next time I won't let the man get on a motorcycle. But we got him through it. He's up and around. We started every day. We started getting him to do a little bit more, a little bit more, a little bit more. And after five days, we rescheduled some things. I have my dad. Yeah, it's been four or five days now. Felt better. The front ribs kind of was cracked. It's not too bad. The back one only hurts when I cough. Stitches are drying up. The big scab on my shoulder's gone. Uh, the one on my elbow is healing up fine. One on my knees. <laughs> and when I get home, my wife is going to beat the hell out of me, so I might as well just bring my day bills with me. Got to meet up at Swanky's here when we get back to the States in a few weeks. And I just know these two guys are going to reel it out and just tell what a big dummy I am. And you know what? I ain't got a leg to stand on. You know, stupid is is what stupid does. <laughs> so don't ever think life... Life is going to be what it's going to be and it's not always what you expect and it's not always what you plan. But don't ever think that what does happen is less than what should have happened. No, this is what was supposed to happen. We're still here. God bless you all. Thank you for joining us. I'm so happy that we fought through this. I'm gonna kick his butt for doing this to us. It's a wonderful day.